introducing myself. My name is Barry McGonigal. I am the International Director of the Learning About Forests program. Um, and today we've put together a very interesting, I don't know if some of you were at the last uh, webinar, but a very interesting webinar from two fantastic presenters on the theme of uh, the mental and physical benefits of outdoor education. So just a few rules for today's um, webinar. The topic is, as I've just said, the mental and physical benefits of outdoor education. Uh, we're keeping you all muted, so please don't un unmute yourselves during the presentation. Uh, this is just to stop uh, a landslide of questions and noise uh, disrupting proceedings. After the presentations, there will be time to ask questions of the presenters, uh, Rachel Geary and Freddie Lemius. So uh, if you th think of something uh, during their presentations you would like to ask after the webinar, please just type the question into the public chat field. Uh, don't try and unmute yourself and ask the question directly, uh, if, you would, if you would be so kind. At the end of the meeting, there will also be an opportunity to engage in an interactive Mentimeter presentation, and details of that will follow after the presentations. Um, if you wish to have a diploma of participation, please write your name and email on private chat, not public chat, so privately to uh, Florian Marie, F-L-O-R-I-A-N-E-M-A-R-I-E. -E -E. uh, and if you send that to her with your, uh, the title diploma, and your name and your email address, Florian will uh, make sure that you receive a uh, diploma participation. Uh, please do fill in the survey monkey. It'll help us improve the webinar and uh, get new suggestions for topics to discuss in the future. And this webinar will be recorded and uploaded to the YouTube channel, YRE International. So if you want to revisit it, please do just go to YRE International on YouTube. Tomorrow there will be a webinar at 2 p.m. Greenwich, uh, I think I'm GTM, I'm thinking that's a little bit of a typo, GMT, Greenwich Mean Time, from our member in Northern Ireland, uh, Keep Northern Ireland Beautiful. Uh, this webinar is on the uh, topic of tackling pointless plastic packaging, uh, something that I think we can all agree needs to be done uh, in earnest now uh, in the world we live in. You can visit their Facebook page and register for free, and that's Keep Northern Ireland Beautiful. You can find them on Facebook, no problem. Florian has just shared the link to register for that webinar on the private chat just now, so you can find it there. I'd like to go ahead now and introduce uh, today's two speakers. Uh, Freddie Lamius is a senior lecturer and associate professor at the Department of Psychology, Clinical Psychology at Uppsala University in Sweden. He's going to discuss nature and health research, examine how gardens and outdoor spaces can support stress management and increase performance in student populations. He's going to talk uh, quite a lot about the concept of restoration skills training, or REST as it's known. Uh, these are topics and, and, uh, uh, and elements of uh, stress reduction, which are also implementable amongst younger students. And uh, to that end, Rachel Geary, who is the Learning About Forests International Coordinator for Ireland, uh, and previously served as the, uh, as the LEAF Director. Um, she will talk a little bit more about the practical implications of this in schools uh, and give some examples of how the Learning About Forests program and outdoor education-based program connects children to nature and uh, reaps several physical and mental health benefits. Uh, so without further ado, I would hand over to Freddie now to give his presentation. Freddie. Thank you very much, Barry. I'll see if I can share my screen here. Just a moment. Are you all seeing that? Yep, I see that clear as a bell, Freddie. Excellent. Okay, thank you all for for attending, for uh, for showing up for this. I'm I'm glad for the opportunity to to talk to you all about some of the work that I'm doing. Uh, my name is Freddy Lumeus. Uh, I'm a practicing psychologist. Um, I'm PhD in psychology. I'm associated with the Uppsala University in Sweden, where I uh, do research and teaching in environmental psychology and health psychology and the intersection between them. So I'll be talking to you uh, today about environmental support for restoration and restoration skills training. So first I thought I'd give you some context and talk a little bit about uh, the research collaboration that we're working within. Um, and then I'd say, I'll like to say something about restorative environments theory so that we're all um, somewhat familiar with with some basic concepts that we're working with in this research field. And then I'm gonna be talking about two lines of studies that we've been doing. I'm gonna say something about how we've studied um, 
the settings around the campus building as a place for uh, restoration during study breaks uh, for university students. Um, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about a meditation based training program that we've developed uh, where we build the meditative practice uh, on experiences in a, in a natural environment, also for university student participants. So the Linnaean collaboration, uh, which is the context where we do the work, uh, centers around the historic botanical gardens in Uppsala. Uh, part of it looks like this. It's a Baroque garden, an old castle garden, and then there's a, a, a new botanical garden that's um, more richly planted and, and, and more biodiverse than this setting. Um, so it's, uh, it's quite centrally located in Uppsala, uh, surrounded by several university campus buildings. And um, founded in the 1600s, in the 1700s, famously governed by uh, Carl von Linnaeus, or Carl Linnaeus, uh, who was co-founder of the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences, which later came to, to um, uh, be involved in, in several of the Nobel Prizes. Uh, he was also the professor of medicine and botany and garden director uh, at Uppsala University. So those three positions were naturally linked together. It was natural to have the same person on all, in all of those roles back then. Um, today we're working in this type of, uh, of a university campus setting. Uh, so uh, we're studying students in their own right. Uh, a lot of psychological research uh, uses students as participants uh, merely for convenience, uh, for lack of, uh, of, of ability to, to get hold of, of more representative uh, groups of participants. But we study uh, students in their own right as a, as a group of, uh, as a subgroup of the population that's involved in cognitively demanded, demanding work, uh, often under relatively poor environmental conditions, as they uh, normally don't have a, a fixed workspace that's optimized for, for the specific work that they're doing. Rather, they're spending a lot of their time in, in this type of setting, a uh, mixed use setting where people eat and drink and socialize and study um, all in, in a big uh, jumble. Uh, which can get quite demanding. So this is a view of a campus building from uh, the new section of the Botanic Garden. Uh, so you can see that it's just adjacent. And if we turn the camera around, we can see the tropical greenhouse that we're using as a, a climate and weather controlled experimental setting. Uh, so as you can see, sometimes it's uh, it's not uh, it's not. Uh, a perfect climate for spending time uh, at least resting outdoors uh, for people who aren't prepared in terms of, of clothing and so on. So we use the greenhouse as, a, as our setting in most of our studies. So it's a short walk of just 50 meters from the campus building. So these are some uh, interior scenes from the greenhouse that we, that we use. It has several rooms with um, different types of vegetation and different, uh, different climates. Uh, so we're able to uh, provide these students with a, a comfortable and diverse natural setting um, that's also accessible to them in their normal day-to-day uh, -day living. They can enter for free whenever they want. So it's, it's um, uh, quite a naturalistic intervention. So that's a little bit about the Linnaean collaboration in which we work. Uh, now I'm moving on to say something about restorative environment theory, uh, the basic framework that we're working with here. It basically uh, exists in response to the question of how come modern urban people seek nature experience? Um, ever since the dawn of the uh, industrial cities, uh, concerns have been raised about how people in these uh, growing cities uh, seem to be suffering. Uh, the, the terminology to describe that, uh, that suffering has, has differed uh, over, the, over the years, obviously. But there seems to be uh, something that's been awakening people as they move into cities, uh, a longing back to nature, so to speak. So Stanley Milgram wrote in the 70s that obviously cities have great appeal because of the variety, eventfulness, possibility of choice, and the stimulation of an intense atmosphere that many individuals find desirable backgrounds to their lives. So in addition to the mere, the, the, the bare um, economics of 
of uh, needing to live in close to a workplace and so on. Uh, the city atmosphere seems to be appealing to a lot of people. Still, um, Milgram goes on in his paper to, this is the, in, in, in the introduction of the paper, and then he goes on to describe um, a long list of different uh, sources of, uh, of, uh, of fatigue and overload that cities contribute with. So the, the idea that, that we need to connect with nature, that urban people need to spend some time in nature, at least now and then, is age old. Uh, the famous landscape architect, uh, Frederick Law Olmsted in, in 1865 wrote, uh, a bit prematurely perhaps, um, that it is a scientific fact. Um, today, uh, we can probably begin to say that it is a scientific fact, um, that the occasional contemplation of natural scenes of an impressive character, uh, particularly if this contemplation occurs in connection with relief from ordinary cares, change of air and change of habits is favorable to the health and vigor. The want of such occasional recreation, where men and women are habitually pressed by their business or household cares, often results in mental and nervous excitability, moroseness, melancholy or irascibility, incapacitating the subject for the proper exercise of the intellectual and moral forces. So I think what he was talking about, even though the word didn't exist at the time, uh, was stress uh, and stress-related problems uh, that he saw occurring in urban populations. So even though most people uh, here in Europe where I work uh, and in many areas around the world uh, are actually living in urban areas, um, when you give people a choice, would you rather spend some time in this setting or that setting, people tend to, cho to, to choose uh, natural settings over the urban ones. So this is data from a series of experiments by Terry Hartig and Hank Stotts, uh, where they gave people just that choice. Uh, would you rather take a walk in this area or that area? <clears throat> and as you can see here, uh, the green bars are high throughout. Uh, people generally tend to prefer to take a walk in the forest area over the city area. But what's really interesting about this is that before answering the question, um, they subjected some of the participants to an attentional fatigue induction. Uh, so they got to work on a boring and demanding attention test. Uh, for a prolonged period, maybe half an hour or so, 45 minutes. Um, so they, um, they've loaded their cognitive system. And what they can see in the data is that when people are more fatigued, they tend to prefer the city less. The forest area is always highly preferred. Uh, so the difference is in the degree of preference for spending some time in the city uh, when we're uh, when we're cognitively fatigued, uh, we tend to have lower preference for, for the urban setting. So that goes to, um, to the theoretical concept of, of being away as, uh, as formulated in, in uh, attention restoration theory uh, by Stephen and Rachel Kaplan, who started working on this in the 80s and, and continued throughout the 90s and zeros. So there's a component in it that's about getting away from uh, the overload uh, of stimulation and demands in a city, the need to keep a lookout for traffic and, say, and, 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 and stay safe and, and process a lot of information to get by safely and efficiently. So there's a drive to get away from that, especially when we're tired, but there's more to it than that. People are also reasoning in terms of what does nature as as such actually contribute to the experience, apart from the opportunity to get away from something negative, nature experience tends to contribute something positive as well. And in this line of reasoning, uh, people, are, people are thinking specifically about the stimulus properties in, in natural phenomena, which, tends to, which tend to uh, have a lot of redundancy. There's lots of information there uh, pleasantly interesting stimulation. Uh, however, it doesn't demand much of us, uh, as with fractal patterns, for instance, uh, patterns that repeat themselves over and over. Uh, we only need to understand one bit of the scene in order to, to comprehend the whole. So we don't need to process every uh, bit of information that's there. Rather, we can engage with and explore the setting 
uh, in our own pace and uh, at our own terms. So that goes, um, that can be seen also in um, in brain imaging studies, like here in uh, in a study by Simone Grassini and and his colleagues from Finland, uh, where they showed people images of natural and urban settings and and uh, and uh, recorded <laughs> EEG electroencephalograph data throughout. So what they could see, uh, as you can see in the center uh, in lower panel there, uh, it's the low range of the alpha band spectrum of brain activity that tends to differ in favor of the natural environment. Uh, and that's the same um, frequency band that we see uh, activated in people engaged in meditation, in meditation studies with the EEG methods. Uh, so the lower range band of the, of the alpha frequency uh, dominates the brain patterns when we view natural scenes versus urban scenes. So this property of natural environments is called soft fascination. Uh, they kind of draw you in and softly hold attention so that you can have a moment of mindfulness without actually um, uh, without actually invoking any any mental effort, the power of will uh, to stay focused. The environment helps you with that. So restoration is the replenishment of an adaptive resource that's become depleted in efforts to meet demands. So the associated functional capabilities are reinstated. So when people process a lot of information, uh, we fatigue our cognitive systems. Uh, and when we study this in experiments, uh, it goes something like this. Uh, we give people an attention test, and then we give them some boring task to do uh, so that we load the cognitive system and induce fatigue, and then we test them again to make sure they're tired. And then we give them a break. They can go to different settings and, and rest, and then we test again to see whether they've uh, recovered or restored uh, the capability. So this is an example from our studies uh, on um, on uh, how, how students can use the, 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 bot the botanical gardens as a study break. Um, so we give them a test and then they work on the same test uh, for a prolonged period of time, about 35, 40 minutes, and then we give them a test again to make sure they're tired. Uh, and then they get to go out and have a rest either in the campus uh, common areas of the campus mm -hmm. building where most students mm -hmm. spend most of their time or they go out to the tropical greenhouse and spend 15 minutes there. Then they come back and do the test again. So this is data from the fatigue induction. And what we can see is that um, uh, the line for, for sustained attention performance uh, shows de gradually deteriorating performance over the fatigue induction. So people's response time become more and more erratic as they grow more and more tired. They kind of drift off and then they pick up again and they drift off and pick up again. So we get um, more variability in the data. So their sustained attention, their capacity to sustain attention deteriorates gradually. And this is data just from the time one, time two, and time three measurements. So before fatigue, after fatigue, and then after rest. And what we can see is that the students who rested in the greenhouse come back performing. Uh, at, the, at the same level as they did at the outset before the fatigue induction, while those who rest indoors continue to deteriorate to some degree. So that's basically how we do it. When we get people to rate their experiences during the study breaks, we also see differences in how they experience the setting and, and, and themselves. So perceived restorativeness, we measure these factors, fascination and being away, they differ uh, strongly between the two different settings. Uh, the sense of fascination and of being away from stressors is way higher in the greenhouse than in the, in the common areas of the campus building. Interestingly, also the experience of state mindfulness, uh, as measured with the Toronto Mindfulness Scale here, um, uh, favors the natural environment. So uh, the Toronto Mindfulness Scale breaks up state mindfulness into two factors. One, that's curiosity, which is um, an open approach orientation to experience, the one that's decentering, it's the ability to view um, personal experiences as, as transient, not necessarily representing uh, truths or, or constraints on, 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 on experience. 
So that's also uh, in favor of the natural setting. And that brings us to restoration skills training, which is a meditation based uh, training course that we've developed and, and centered several studies around. Uh, so mindfulness training is good. The evidence base for its uh, salutary effects are, is, uh, is pretty strong already and it's growing. However, there's a problem in that. Uh, if we're marketing or proposing mindfulness training as an intervention for people who suffer, who suffer stress and, and, uh, and, and attention problems, concentration problems, uh, we should be aware uh, that the training tends to be most difficult for those people who already suffer the most, those who would need it the most. Um, so this data is a simple correlation between how people performed on an attention test before a mindfulness training course started um, and how much mindfulness exercise they actually completed during the course. So you can see that it's a pretty strong positive correlation. Those who had more attention problems to begin with practiced less so they'd be less likely to gain anything from the training. That's a problem that we want to address with the restoration skills training approach. So it's a five week mindfulness based course that we've adapted uh, to make the practices draw on restorative qualities in the, nat the natural setting so people can rely less on the power of will uh, uh, to induce the meditative state and rely more on external support for those experiences. So we conduct the course in the tropical greenhouse that I showed you before. Uh, we developed it uh, from the framework of, of the well-established MBSR mindfulness-based stress reduction course which is the most researched uh, secular, secular mindfulness training course. Um, so we took that as a starting point and gradually adapted the practices uh, to, to draw support from the natural setting. And each time we compared the rest course to conventional mindfulness training, MBSR type mindfulness training that we did indoors in the, in the campus building in this type of setting. So the aims with the development of REST was to create an easier introduction to mindfulness training for people with stress and concentration problems. Mind you, these are university students, so the mean age is around 20, 22 or something. Um, slightly older maybe than some of the, of the people that most of you are working with. Um, but even though it's, easy, it's, uh, it's meant to be an easier introduction to mindfulness training, we still wanted it to be at least as efficacious in producing health benefits and in attentional improvements as conventional mindfulness training. So we don't want to compromise the, the, with the quality of the, of the training. So we conducted several studies uh, to affirm this. One thing that we checked was how well people engage with the practice. So we have these five 90-minute uh, classes over five weeks uh, with a progressive learning structure. So each uh, the content of each uh, class builds on the content covered in the preceding weeks. They do homework exercise as well uh, to meditate with formal exercises and informal ex exercises between the classes. Uh, so one thing that we could see uh, was that the rate of completion of the course uh, was uh, way better with the rest course than with a conventional mindfulness training course. Conventional mindfulness training had about 27% dropout, which is um, very near the median uh, reported in meta-analyses of, of, uh, of course compliance in mindfulness training courses. So it's not unusually high. It's rest that has unusually low dropout rates. Looking at how much they actually practiced with homework exercises between the classes, we could see that in the conventional mindfulness training course, uh, those who stuck with the course throughout uh, started out practicing a bit more than the rest participants, but then they gradually declined in the rate of mindfulness practice completed per week, while the rest participants maintained a steady meditation habit throughout the, the, the weeks of the course. So we interpret that as an advantage for rest as well. At follow-up six months later, we could see that uh, fewer rest participants stopped practicing altogether. Um, 
So about 92% of the rest participants reported having used mindful, the mindfulness techniques uh, in one way or another, at least about once, once a month uh, or more um, uh, in six months following the course. So fewer people drop out altogether. So we conclude that rest is a more acceptable introduction to mindfulness training than the conventional approach. And it's attended by more long-term commitment to mindfulness practice. So we study the effects on attention performance, uh, attention test performance as well. One thing that we did was we give them, gave them attention tests before the classes started uh, at enrollment and then on the first and third and fifth uh, week of the training course. So we can see a jump in performance between week one and week three of the course. So that tells us that something's happening that's connected to the actual training itself. This was seen in a substitu substitution test, and it was also seen in the trail making test, which is another attention test, uh, part B of that test. Performance jumped between week one and week three of the, of, the, of the course. But then we also gave them another test uh, just after a, a meditation session. So this data shows uh, the difference uh, between how they perform just before the, the class and then how they perform after 20 minutes of, of meditation. So this is the same data I just showed you. Just after meditation, 20 minutes of meditation training, uh, we can see that in the first weeks, both rest and, and conventional mindfulness training participants tend to improve uh, in attention performance with the meditation. But on the fifth week, rest participants continue to improve while the participants in conventional training suddenly deteriorate. So we interpret that as a sign of having invoked effort um, in, in producing the meditative state. As they, have, as they learn the skills to self-regulate the meditation, they produce more effort in, in, in it over this brief uh, introductory course. With the switching cost index from the trail making test, uh, we can see a slightly different pattern. Here we can see uh, lower scores are, 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 are better scores here. So uh, here we can see that the rest participants um, at, in week one and week three, nothing much happened to either the rest or CMT participants, but on the fifth week, the rest participants improved. They restored attention regulation capabilities with the meditation. So as they've trained and learned these skills over five weeks, they've gained the capability to, uh, to draw efficiently on the natural environment um, to support restoration of attention performance. So we conclude that rest is able to train restoration skills over time. And we conclude that rest training can improve general attention capabilities without incurring effort. And I'm gonna be brief about all of these upcoming things. We also uh, had them rate different uh, aspects of uh, psychological functioning and health uh, before the course, right after the course, and at the six-month follow-up. So we can see that uh, in ratings with the FFMQ, uh, ratings of mindfulness skills, uh, they improved sig uh, substantially with the course. Uh, for the rest participants, that improvement was sustained at six months, uh, not clearly so for the CMT participants which might be connected to the fact that they that fewer of them continue to practice after the course. CFQ is a measure of, uh, of attention problems, self-perceived attention problems in day-to-day -day life living. Uh, we see uh, substantive improvements for both rest and CMT uh, participants that are also su sustained at the six month follow-up. Uh, for PSS ratings, ratings of chronic stress experiences, um, the results are less consistent and, and, and less strong and tend to dissipate uh, at the six month follow up for both courses. So conclusions from this, less effortful and more acceptable rest training is no less beneficial than, than conventional mindfulness training. And we can see that rest and, and conventional mindfulness training are both attended by sustained improvements in attentional functioning. So the general conclusions from the rest studies are that um, we can train people uh, in enhancing restorative transactions. So we can teach people the skills to be able to draw more efficiently 
on nature experience to support restoration of, of fatigue cognitive functions uh, by using mind adapted mindfulness uh, techniques. We conclude that the setting matters in meditation. Uh, meditation is not just a, an inwards practice where you sit still with the eyes closed and, and disconnect from the setting, focusing on thought contents or difficult uh, emotional contents. Um, uh, the setting actually matters. And we can turn the meditation outwards to meditate along with the setting in a, in a, in a transaction with the setting. We conclude that rest is a viable alternative uh, to conventional mindfulness training for beginners with stress or concentration problems. And we're moving on now to see if we can implement or adapt the, the rest practices to also suit younger people. Uh, so we're going to uh, conduct a pilot study in the fall now uh, with um, elementary school uh, children, ages about 8 to 10, uh, to see if we can reformulate the rest ex exercises to suit uh, younger age groups as well. And uh, yeah, that's it for me. Uh, I want to thank you all for listening. Uh, and uh, feel free to ask questions. You also have my email address in the, in the materials here. So, um, so you can contact me if you have specific questions. Thank you very much for listening. Eddie, thank you so much indeed. That was a, a fascinating presentation and uh, you touched on, I think, a lot of, I know I said this last time, but an awful lot of novel concepts, um, especially in your last, in your summary there, the the idea that the, the setting matters. Uh, I think that this is something which is uh, news to some, but uh, really this, this the ideas behind it, the concepts that you outline of soft fascination and the mind's ability to process uh, the kind of background noise, as it were, um being more difficult in a built environment than it is in a natural environment is something i think intrinsically we have all felt and we all know about but to have the scientific evidence for it uh is uh, is really beneficial i think um i won't uh, i'll let people ask you more questions uh freddie after the uh, after rachel is present presented if that's okay uh and i'd just like to move on then with uh sorry yes freddie thanks again um and I'll just, I'll just move on to, uh, to Rachel. Rachel, if you'd like to, uh, to give your presentation, please. Um, I'll just share my screen. Okay, can everyone see and hear me there? Um, thanks for that very informative. We, we can see and hear you, Rach, but we can't see your screen, I think. I can just... Uh... Um, are we okay there? There we go. That's it. Yep. Absolutely. Great. Thanks. Okay. Are we okay now? Okay, so thanks very much for that very informative uh, presentation, Freddie. It's really great to see that there's a growing um, body of research confirming the benefits of outdoor learning. Um, as Barry mentioned, I oversee the Learning About Forest program here in Ireland. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the work that we do and go into a little bit more detail about the outdoor spaces that we are creating here in Ireland in some of our leaf schools and I look forward to answering um, your questions at the end. So we have been running the LEAF programme in the southwest of Ireland for four years. We've worked with 63 schools, mostly primary, um, a few secondary schools, and one teacher training college. We generally work with one classroom per school, um, which would have an average of about 30 students per class. So that's 142 classes and over three and a half thousand students over the past four years. The overall aim, as Barry would have mentioned earlier, is um, to raise the awareness about the key role that forests play in our lives. And through our LEAF programme and a Creel Bjorg initiative, which I'll talk a little bit more about later, um, we have planted almost 4,000 trees with these students that we've been working with. 
Each of our participating schools receives a four hour long forest based workshop and this is, in, is spent entirely outdoors. So that's a total of 568 hours educating outdoors and then a further 284 hours outdoors through our school based workshops. Um, now these workshops are also four hours long, but they tend to be a mix of indoor and outdoor activities using either the school grounds or a nearby green area. Um, we would have a range of activities that cover the five leaf themes, which include water, climate, biodiversity, community and products. Um, now these are all hands-on activities and they tie in really nicely with the school curriculum such as maths, geography, history, art, physical education. So we feel really strongly about getting students outdoors during our workshops as we feel this is really the best place to learn about nature and of course tends to be a lot more fun for the students also. Um, but we are aware that students today are spending less time outdoors um, for various reasons and some of um, these reasons I'll just talk about briefly. Um, these are the type of things that we encounter in our work with the schools. So something most of us are very familiar with is an increase in the amount of screen time. Um, location would also be an issue for some of our students um, where they might live in a city or maybe they have little or no experience to natural environments. Um, there's also an increase in the amount of structured activities, for example, um, after school clubs or summer camps. So this tends to mean less free outdoor playtime where children can really explore their natural surroundings and use their imagination. And then finally, um, quite a big one would be anxieties around safety and a perceived lack of safe places to play. Um, so just to give you a little example, um, the forests where we would bring our students is crisscrossed with paths for walking and cycling. But just off any of these paths are wild areas and adventurous places for kids to explore. Um, still quite safe, but just off the beaten path. Um, and teachers have often commented how they bring their own children to the same forest um, and always stick to these paths, never thinking to take their children a little deeper into the forest and explore all the wonders that are there. So all these contributing factors mean that children today are um, unfortunately spending less time outdoors. According to one of the teachers that we work with, um, we are living in very transitory times, child obesity, video games, sedentary lifestyles, and then in a lot of cases, so much of the child stimulation would come from screen time. So you might ask, what are the issues with all of this? Um, spending less time outdoors often goes hand in hand with um, um, less physical activity. And so some of the issues we would come across in the schools would be obesity. Um, and actually something which I haven't included on the list, but something we see um, quite a lot of, especially while we are going off the paths in the forest, is maybe the students' lack of coordination over uneven surfaces or an inability to do a simple task such as climbing a fence. Um, so this might be hard to believe for people that have grown up in the countryside or for those exposed to the outdoors when they were young. Um, but this is a genuine problem for or issue for some of the students that we encounter. Um, teachers also often report that students today have lower concentration levels and are very easily distracted during their lessons. And finally, if there's a lack of contact with the natural world um, from spending less time outdoors, then this often leads to a lack of understanding um, about the natural world. So we, we feel that we really must ensure that students learn to enjoy the outdoors and have positive experience outdoors in order to develop this positive attitude towards their environment and understand the natural world a little bit better. So taking a look at our own programme um, and how 
we try to alleviate some of these problems on a very basic level we would maximize the amount of time we spend outdoors during both our workshops whether they're forest or school based and limit the time um, given to more traditional types of presentations such as powerpoint um, but also we would hope that exposing children to nature would lead to an increased interest in nature and therefore maybe a greater want or desire to even be outdoors more. Now, we haven't actually gathered specific data on this, but we would have a lot of anecdotal evidence from the teachers to support this. Um, with regards to location, to date, we have been very lucky with them. Thanks to generous donation, we have been able to bring all our participating schools to a mixed um, woodland forest, which is owned by our state forestry company, Quilcha. This is for their forest-based workshop. And then for their school-based workshop, we would always coordinate with the teachers prior to the visit um, to identify a nearby green area if the school itself has no green space around it. So the anxieties and perceptions then around safety vary quite a bit from school to school. Um, some would have very strict rules about running and play in general, while others then would be much more relaxed. Um, I would imagine the same goes for households, but I'm going to stick to our experience with schools. Um, so as a rule, our staff would have a high level of health and safety training and always inform um, the teachers of this before any workshop takes place. We also would give introductory health and safety talks, keeping in mind that for many of the children, it may be their very first time to a forest. Um, and prior to all our workshops, we communicate with the teachers about what to wear, what to expect, and we would always ensure that ratios are being adhered to. Um, I think it's very important being informed and um, being prepared is the very first step towards reducing anxieties around safety. And it's very important to feel safe in nature for one to really reap the benefits, the mental and physical benefits of being outdoors. Um, according to the teachers um, that we would work with, the benefits of the LEAF programme include an improved concentration amongst the students back in the classroom after the workshops. Um, it builds their confidence. Children are able to enjoy the natural world around them. The outdoor learning without restrictions of walls and desks. Active learning for students. And then also tapping into children's innate love for nature and sense of wonder. Um, so I'm not sure, Florian, if we have time to share the link for the video. Um, yes, I think I will just put it in the chat now. Okay. okay. So um, yeah. I'm going to stop sharing my video and Florian will share a video link in the chat. Um, this is just a short two minute video um, to give some of our the perspectives um, from the teachers and the benefits of the programme.
I guess people had time and I think we can go back to your presentation. <laughs> Okay, so I hope you enjoy that little video. If you didn't get to see it, the link is there and you can okay. watch it. Oops, sorry about that. <laughs> okay, so um, that just gives a little bit of an insight to the teacher's perspective. Um, we go to the schools and then we leave and I think it's always nice to see um, how they feel about the programme. Um, I mentioned at the start of the presentation, we also run an, an initiative called Creel, On Creel Bjog, which is the Irish for a little woodland. Um, so Creel Bjogs are open to all participating LEAF schools and schools that are interested and are able to commit to long-term care and maintenance of their wood woodland are considered for this initiative. Creel Bjogs are small, dense, biodiverse native woodland habitats. Um, now these sites are planned, planted and managed by the students and the teachers on the grounds. Um, we feel that it is really important that the students are involved in the entire process um, to encourage a greater sense of ownership of the woodland. Um, the intention is that these quillbjogs or little woodlands are used as outdoor living classrooms with space created for seating. So these habitats provide an educational and recreational resource for the whole school community. Um, and enable a school to and students to participate in the LEAF programme, citizen science, woodland skills, nature connection and well-being. The objectives of the Creel Bjog are that we keep it site specific. So for example, some of our schools might like to plant a linear hedgerow with a small cluster of trees at one end, while others may prefer to have a cluster of trees. Um, we also keep it, um, we need to consider the location and soil type and then we're creative, flexible and dynamic in our approach. We will always share and collaborate with others, for example, the local authorities in the area or other programmes that we might run. The initiative is accessible, affordable and replicable for any school. And then finally, we will always acknowledge the work and voluntary commitment of the schools, the students and the teachers. So just to give you a little bit of an example of what the work on the ground, we've planted six of these little woodlands to date. Um, one was planted in Skullwater Day in March in 2018. In this school, we planted approximately 400 trees, and these were planted again, as I say, by the teachers and students. Normally, the space planted is usually about 200 meters squared with approximately 200 trees of mixed native species, appropriate soil type and local condition. So the top picture here shows um, the students admiring all their hard work after the planting and mulching was completed. We also included um, a classroom space in the centre for them to go out and work afterwards um, in their different classroom activities. Um, and we encouraged the students to develop a nature trail over time. And as you can see from the bottom picture, educational signage was included in 2019 with a main information board and then smaller signs to help identify the various species and layers of the woodland. And then by June 2019, it provided a really fabulous outdoor space where the students were able to keep cool on a hot sunny day, which you can see here in the bottom picture of this slide. According to the teachers from the six schools that we've planted in, um, it makes it easier to incorporate outdoor, outdoor, outdoors into the curriculum. Um, it encourages students to foster an interest in their local and natural environment. They learn lifelong skills, it encourages teamwork, and there's a greater sense of ownership and responsibility when they've been involved in the entire process. And then finally, it also links in with the wellbeing programmes in the schools. 
Um, just to give you a very brief example of the resources and activities before I finish up, we continuously develop and share LEAF and Creole Bureau resources online and they can be found on our website, leafireland.org. There is a whole range of forest related outdoor activities available here for download. Um, and we are also devising ways to measure the impacts of what we do. Um, just very briefly then to give you um, some very simple activities, well-being activities that can be done with any age group, young and old. Um, the first is sound mapping. So this can be done in two ways. You can keep it very simple and just give students um, a place to sit with their eyes open or closed and listening to the sounds around them. Now you can vary the length of time depending on the age of the students. So we normally vary it between one and five minutes depending on their age. And then another option is to give the students a blank sheet of paper and get them to mark the X in the center. This X represents themselves and then they draw or write what they hear and what direction it's coming from. So for example, if they hear a bird singing in front of them, they will draw or write the word bird towards the top of the page and so on. Another very basic example is simply giving the students free time to build dens or simply explore nature around them. And for this, all you need to do is set some clear boundaries at the beginning from a health and, health and safety perspective. So for example, telling the students to stay within the view of the facilitator or don't go beyond a certain landmark and be mindful of others while they're playing and exploring. So just to finish um, off my presentation, I'd like just to give you feedback from two of the teachers that we work with. Um, we can gather figures relating to the number of hours spent outdoors, but at the end of the day, as I mentioned, it's the teachers that are going back to the classrooms with the students and noticing the changes in behavior and well-being. So the first is from a fourth class teacher in St. Bridget's National School. Outdoor education helps to elevate mood and decrease anxiety as it is a welcomed change from hours of sitting at a desk indoors. <clears throat> the children become more active, which makes them healthier and happier, which in turn means they can do better academically. Learning about nature appeals to the senses as children get the opportunity to see, smell and hear and touch the world around them. One of the most memorable moments of the LEAF programme was when we climbed the hill overlooking the lake, the house and the trees. We all stopped for a moment, closed our eyes and listened to the sound of the birds in the trees, the whistling of the wind and the flowing water. These moments of silence and appreciation of the natural world around us are few and far between in our everyday busy classroom. It was a very memorable and positive experience for the children. And finally, according to another, there is no doubt that the programme is hugely beneficial to the health and well-being of our students. So thank you for listening and look forward to answering any of your questions. Rachel, thank you very much indeed for that. I'm obviously tremendously biased, but I still think that the LEAF programme is uh, one of the most fantastic things we can offer our youth uh, worldwide. I think the ideas that you've uh, summarized there of connecting them with nature, making them empowered to make their own decisions, uh, giving them a voice uh, in the class, making them more um, aware of the situation in the world regarding the environment, it prepares them very well uh, to, to tackle the issues facing them as they grow up. And I think allied to what Freddie was talking about, this idea of providing a, a safe place to, to just to, to, to uh, power up again and to get some headspace. Um, these tiny forests are an essential part and nature in general for anybody, for any young person who needs to just get a little bit of time away from the stresses of, of their lives as they, as they uh, mature. So uh, we, uh, without, uh, we don't have much time left, but um, I'd like to hand over to Florian now who will share uh, a question or two before um, we, uh, we move on to the Mentimeter. Uh, thank you very much again, everybody. So we had a few questions on the chat and I think the first one was from two teachers from Northern Ireland who were asking if uh, you were also uh, running the program in Northern Ireland because they would be, they're running eco schools, but uh, what's the situation now in Northern Ireland? It's also a question for Paris. <laughs> 
I suppose that's one. Yes, I can take. Um, we have actually uh, been working with Northern Ireland. They were at the Leaf Nam, the national operator meeting, which was held in, in Ireland, Southern Ireland, um, uh, a couple of years ago. And it was uh, since then, however, there's been a number of staff changes. So it's an issue that I'll need to follow up on. But please do contact me directly. Uh, my email address is uh, Florian, if you wouldn't mind just sharing that in the chat. Uh, you can contact me there and I'll happily uh, put you in touch with the people uh, in Northern Ireland who we talk to. <laughs> and uh, before going to Mentimeter question, there was also a comment about how school gardens can uh, also help uh, uh, students to also reconnect to nature. So, Freddie or Rachel, do you also think that school garden can be a good initiative? Absolutely. Uh, Freddie, I can jump in and you can <laughs> add to it if you like. Um, yes, yeah, school gardens, any to be honest, any green space <laughs> um, around the school or around their local area um, is a place for learning. Um, it doesn't have to be a rich Hello, um, woodland or anything like that. A vegetable garden is a place for exploration and learning. So absolutely. Yeah, I would agree. Um, there's some uh, interesting um, studies having been conducted around the Greening Schoolyards project in the Netherlands. Um, that's uh, that really provides some some uh, hard evidence behind the the, the benefits of of uh, greening schoolyards, uh, especially for uh, the physical activity of girls, um, according to that data, uh, which helps them. Um, uh, helps them helps them play more actively and more prosocially with each other. Uh, so I think those are good examples. Thank you very much. So we'll go for a small interaction in Mentimeter. So if you're not really familiar with Mentimeter, we will just ask you to go to www.menti.com. So on any device, so it will be on your computer or on your phone, and use this code six. 6856 to just answer a few questions. So I will give you a few minutes. And the first one if, is if you have any question or comments that you didn't have the chance to ask directly on chat, just feel free to ask. And if we don't have time to take all the questions, we will also answer them later on. And uh, as I see also in the chat, at the chat, there was another question uh, asking, is the practical se session of planting trees is considered as mainstream of education or extracurriculum activity? Um, I take it that's for me. Um, no, so it would not be part of the mainstream curriculum. We are... Um, doing it in schools that are participating in the LEAF programme, so it would be extracurricular. Now we, in Ireland, have a, a National Tree Day and also a National Tree Week, and we would always encourage schools to take part in planting if they can't do it on their school grounds, to do it in their community, but again, this would be extracurricular, not um, part of the mainstream curriculum. And so I see also a question if uh, there will be also conclusion on young girl children from your studies, Freddie. Yes, yeah, I'm, I'm also looking forward to seeing those results, but I think uh, there are a few years in the making uh, if we wanna uh, pilot it this fall and then uh, develop it further and really test um, and be sure about uh, what we're talking about. So I'd be happy to return and a few years to talk about those results. <laughs> so we'll move to the next question. Uh, so for everyone, have you ever been part of outdoor learning before uh, as a teacher or as a student? If yes, where did you go? So was it forest, uh, school gardens? So we're like looking forward to see if you've already been part of this. Uh, outdoor education. So 
if people are joining, you can also write on chat if you don't have Menti. But for the over, you can go to www.menti.com and use this code 66856. So we wait uh, to the beach in school. We went out to look at the nearby nature, green space in school mainly, school nature trail uh, and local forest. So as Rachel mentioned, it can be also in your local environment. And it's even in urban uh, context, it's also easy to find places. Uh, so because we're in running out of time, I uh, will go to the last oops, two question just about general feedback on the webinar. If you find the webinar useful, and I will also thank uh, our two really great speakers, Freddie and Rachel, for this really, really informative session. And I think that everyone learned a lot. And uh, thank you again. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, thank you very much, Freddie, and thank you very much, Rachel. Um, this is the second webinar you've been part of now, and I have to say it has been very, very successful just from the in, in point in terms of the feedback we received, um, but also the engagement. It's been one of the most popular webinars I think we've had. Um, uh, I really, really sincerely appreciate personally you giving your time for this, and I uh, and thank you as well for uploading all of your resources and sharing them with everybody. Um, I hope that when we have webinars in the future, you'll feel like participating as a, uh, uh, you know, as a member of the audience, so to speak, um, and share your knowledge there and ask all the pertinent questions as well of us. But uh, for now, I think that's, um, that concludes today's, today's webinar, um, if I'm not mistaken, Florian. Yes, indeed. So I would like to thank everybody else who has joined us as well from all around the world. I saw people from uh, Indonesia and India, the whole way back to, to Scotland and Northern Ireland and everything in between America, all around the world. Um, so I hope this has been a benefit to you. Um, please do stay uh, up to date with the webinars that Fee run, especially the, through YRE, and uh, feel free to contact any of us uh, for further information about the programs or the organization. Uh, with that, I bid you a very good day, and thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Barry and Florian. <laughs>